Share with me our call to worship. Almighty God, undiminished by the names we give you. God of creation, whose breath brought life into nothingness. God of grace and mercy, who brought the abundant and eternal life to all who believe through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. May we pray together. Eternal God, we know the valleys all too well. At any moment, in any season, we may be plunged into the shadows of the valley. We feel the valley and the pandemic around us, a friend's death, a loved one's diagnosis of cancer, a broken relationship, and how we long to climb out of the valley quickly, to fight the loss, to ignore the pain, to run from the hurt and confusion. Tender God, our loving good shepherd, walk with us in all the valleys of life. Teach us to listen and to trust and believe that you are molding the hurts and losses into a new shape for living and even for smiling. Amen. Eternal God, we thank you that we no longer need fear the valleys of the shadow of death. For Christ, our good shepherd, walks with us. Not only does Christ walk with us, but he has already gone ahead of us. He's gone ahead of us, taking the punishment for our sin, dying in our place so that we need have no fear of the valley of the shadow of death. For we have been forgiven, forgiven of all our sin, cleansed of all unrighteousness, perfectly healed, made completely holy in your sight. We thank you, Lord. We praise you in the name of the Good Shepherd, even Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. While the Kita Khrushchev was premier of the Soviet Union, he denounced many of the policies and atrocities of Joseph Stalin. In the midst of one of his speeches one time, a heckler in the crowd shouted, you were one of his colleagues. Why didn't you say something then? Why didn't you try to stop him then? Khrushchev screamed, who said that? There was deathly silence. No one in the room moved a muscle. Khrushchev then spoke. Now you know why I never said anything. Fear, fear can silence us, can't it? Fear can confuse us. And sometimes fear can even paralyze us. It can just stop us dead in our tracks. But it doesn't have to. Just one more thing. After the Sabbath, 
At dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who is crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now, I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy. And they ran to tell his disciples. Did you notice that in one form or another, fear is mentioned three times in that passage. And did you notice that the two groups of people that are afraid deal differently with their fear? The guards, the guards were afraid and what happened? When they were afraid, what did they do? It says, they became like dead men. They were paralyzed by their fear. The women, on the other hand, they were afraid, and yet, what did they do? They allowed themselves to overcome their fear. They allowed themselves to be filled with joy, even in the midst of their fear. They obeyed the word of God through the angel, and they ran to tell the disciples. Fear and the two different responses. Paralyzed by fear and do nothing or overcoming fear and still obeying God. Have you ever been afraid? So afraid that you were silenced by your fear? Afraid to speak? Afraid to say what you thought? Afraid to speak a word? Have you ever been so afraid that you just couldn't think clearly? So afraid that your fear totally confused you? Have you ever been so afraid that your fear froze you like those guards who became dead men? Have you ever been so afraid that you were paralyzed by your fear? I remember years ago in Zanesville, Ohio, we had a church picnic. And the picnic was at a park with a lake, and the lake had a diving board, and I went off the diving board, and then it had a high dive, which was 100 meters high. 
Not really, but it seemed that way. <laughs> and the kids kept going off the high dive and they said, Pastor, Pastor, go up the high dive. Well, you know, I finally had to go off the high dive, even though I have a fear of heights. So I finally climbed up. It took me half an hour to climb up. I mean, that was so high. And I started going out on that board. And guess what? I was paralyzed by fear. It's like, now I'm out here. What do I do? I can't very well go back. Have you ever been paralyzed by fear? I did jump off, by the way. It wasn't a fancy dive. It was like, Meow. by the way, in case you wondered, I did survive. You know, the funny thing is the same time I've always wanted to skydive. I had a chance when I was in ROTC. Didn't do it. But I would venture to say that all of us at one time or another, we have been afraid. Probably sometimes to the point of being paralyzed by fear. You know, the funny thing is, do you know what the number one fear of Americans is? The number one fear of Americans is public speaking. Do you know what the number two fear is? Death. I just find it amazing that people are scared to death to speak in public. Now, I'm afraid to die when I'm preaching, but, or telling a joke. Fear is something that we all deal with at one time or another. And because fear is something that we all deal with, it's not surprising that, guess what? God has a lot to say about fear in his word. Did you know that in one form or another, fear not. Do not be afraid. In one form or another, fear not appears over 300 times from Genesis to Revelation. God tells us either to an individual or to a group of people. He tells us, do not be afraid. God makes it abundantly clear that he does not want us to be afraid in the face of adversity, no matter what the obstacle, no matter what we face, no matter what comes against us, God says, do not be afraid. With such words from the Lord God, creator of the universe. Why is it that so often we respond to a situation, we respond to a crisis, we respond to an obstacle? Why is it that so often we respond, how? With fear. Especially when God says, there is a better way. Listen to what Paul says to Timothy, and I believe to us. For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. In the NIV, in the translation in the pew, it says, God did not give us a spirit of timidity. Some translations say God did not give us a spirit of cowardice. But I, I believe the, the better image in the Greek is God did not give us a spirit of fear. It's all contained in fear, timidity, cowardice. 
If fear doesn't come from God, where does it come from? One important thing to remember is there is both healthy fear and unhealthy fear. And we need to be able to understand the difference because when we know the difference between healthy and unhealthy fear, it helps us to know how to deal with it. So consider healthy fear because healthy fear will literally save your life. Pretend for a moment you're walking in the woods and you stumble upon a mama bear and her three cubs. What are you going to do? You know, it reminds me of the story of the man walking in the woods who comes upon a mama bear. And the man wonders, what should I do? So immediately, guess what he does? He prays, oh God, save me from this bear. God, please make this bear a Christian bear. Save me. The man opens his eyes and he sees the bear down on his knees, bowed in prayer. Father, for what I am about to receive, I give thee thanks. <laughs> Okay, he prayed that the bear be a Christian. But if you come upon a mama bear and her three cubs and you're afraid, that's called healthy fear. I wouldn't take the time to stand there and debate, well, is this healthy or is this? I would just turn and run. Healthy fear heightens and sharpens your senses, which is a great benefit. whether you call it fear or common sense, healthy fear is beneficial. And you need to recognize it as such because it can save your life. And the Bible tells us about a healthy fear of God. For example, Proverbs 1, 7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge. Now, in the Hebrew, the word fear is best understood as reverence. Reverence that talks about our posture towards God. It is good and right to have a healthy respect of God who he is. He is the creator, master, sustainer of the universe. To give him anything less is a mistake. He is not the man upstairs. In Psalm 5, 7, David says, in reverence, I will bow down. Think about it. People bow down before earthly kings and queens. Why? Out of fear, out of reverence. Should we not do even more to the Lord God, creator of heaven and earth? In Proverbs 9, 10, Solomon says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. David had a healthy fear of the Lord throughout his life. Solomon knew that the fear of God was the beginning of all knowledge and wisdom. It brings an understanding of life. Godly fear. Godly reverence, godly understanding, godly wisdom is all about knowing the proper place of God. As 
creator of the universe, but also the proper place of God in our lives. He's God. We're not. As we think about unhealthy fear, we need to understand that of fear, but a spirit of power, of love, and self-discipline. God doesn't want us to be paralyzed by, by fear, but God wants us to overcome fear so that we can grow in our walk with him. In his letter to the church at Thessalonica, Paul says, it is God's will that you be sanctified. In his letter to the church at Jerusalem, James wrote, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. God wants us to persevere, to finish the race, so that we become mature and complete, not lacking anything. You know, the early church, the early disciples, they faced many, many problems, many obstacles that had the potential to produce fear. They faced ridicule. They faced persecution. They faced prison, torture, even death. Now, I don't think that we face those same obstacles, but we can be bullied and ridiculed for our faith, we can face different types of persecution and we can be filled with fear for our faith. But God tells us, fear not. In fact, in the Beatitudes, Jesus says, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice. Be glad. Fear can rob us of joy. Fear can paralyze us from moving forward in our relationship with God. But Instead of a spirit of fear, we have been called to a spirit of power, a spirit of love, a spirit of self-discipline. You know, it's interesting. The same word that Paul used to encourage Timothy is the same word that Christ used in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 when he spoke to the disciples right before ascending to heaven, he said, and you will receive power. Do not. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. When we have God's Holy Spirit in us, we have the power to overcome fear. That's why God says, do not be afraid. That's why, even though they were afraid, the women weren't paralyzed like the guards 
they were filled with joy and they obeyed God and they ran to tell the disciples. If you are experiencing unhealthy fear that is trying to stop you in your tracks, remember that you also have the spirit of power so that you can overcome your fear and you can be filled with joy and hope and peace. And then John uses the same word that Paul used for love when John writes in his letter, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. When we walk in the spirit of love, guess what? Fear is driven from us. Walk in a spirit of power and a spirit of love. You know, there's the saying, fear knocked at the door. Faith answered. No one was there. But the same is true when love answers the door. Fear must leave. And then the third term that Paul uses is self-discipline. Any of you struggle with self-discipline? Uh, Diane had to buy that ice cream. You know, I tell her that she needs to hide it, but she puts it in the freezer. I can find it in the freezer. Paul says that we need a spirit of self-discipline to overcome fear. You know, isn't it just like God to give us exactly what we need? God says it's going to take self-discipline for you to overcome fear. But if that's what you need, I will give you what you need. Self-discipline to read your Bible. And know that there are all those verses that tell you to fear not, to be not afraid. You know, when I think of the fact that God gives us everything that we need to overcome fear, to be filled with joy and hope and peace, you know what I think of? I think of the 23rd Psalm. Because the Lord is my shepherd. What's next? I shall not want, because the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything that I need. Did you ever think about that? I have everything that I need to overcome fear. God knew that we needed power and love and self-discipline to overcome fear. And that's what he gives us. Do you know who Brian Simo is? I doubt if you've ever heard that name before. Brian Simo is a race car driver. I bet you didn't know that. But there's one thing about Brian Simo that I bet you do know. In 1985, Brian created the No Fear clothing line. It was a big hit among Americans. But guess what? Before Brian Simo came up with the tagline No Fear, God had already come up with it. I wonder if he paid royalties to God. Why does God tell us 
over 300 times in the Bible, no fear, because God knows how damaging fear can be. Did you know doctors estimate that 90% of chronic patients who see physicians today have one common symptom? Oh, the trouble doesn't start with the cough or chest pain or acid reflux. In 90% of the time, the chronic symptom is, guess what? Fear. This is the opinion of a well-known internist. This is also the consensus of a growing body of specialists. Fear of losing a job, fear of old age, fear of a divorce, fear of dying. And sooner or later that fear manifests itself as a clinical symptom. Sometimes the fear is nothing more than superficial anxiety. Of course, so I remember the tombstone that was engraved, the tombstone of a hypochondriac engraved with the message, I told you I was sick. Martin Luther made this interesting observation in his writing table talk. God and the devil take opposite tactics in regard to fear. The Lord first allows us to become afraid in order that he might relieve our fears and comfort us, giving us the power to overcome our fears. The devil, on the other hand, first makes us feel secure in our pride and our sins so that we might later be overwhelmed with fear and despair. I believe that that speaks to just how destructive unhealthy fear can be in our lives. That's why we need power and love and self-discipline. That's why we need God to help us overcome fear. We desperately need to check ourselves daily even and deal with our unhealthy fears. That's why we need the power of God's Holy Spirit to overcome those healthy fears. And thankfully, God gives us that power of love, of self-discipline, of his Holy Spirit. The challenge for us is straightforward. When you begin to feel fear, don't be paralyzed by it. Just stop and identify, is it a healthy fear? or unhealthy. Now, if you're standing in front of a mama bear with three baby cubs, don't take too long. But when you figure out that it's an unhealthy fear, just stop and pray to God. Pray for God to give you a spirit of power, of love and self-discipline to overcome that fear and to grow in joy and hope and peace. Remember God's word to Joshua and to each and every one of us. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For I, the Lord your God, will be with you wherever you go. When afraid, remember the example of the women at the tomb. Afraid, and yet filled with joy. They obeyed. 
they kept moving down the path that God had laid out for them. Don't let fear stop you in your tracks. Don't let fear keep you from the path that God has laid out for you. Don't let fear rob you from the joy and the peace and the hope that God has in store for you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Jesus said, you believe in God. Believe also in me. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives I unto you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Our Father and our God, like never before, let us hear your words to not be afraid. Let us hear your words that you have not given us a spirit of fear, but you have given us your spirit, a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. You have given us your spirit to overcome so that we might know joy and hope and peace. In the name of Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord's Supper is the sign and seal of eating and drinking in communion with the crucified and risen Lord. During his earthly ministry, Jesus shared meals with his followers as a sign of community and acceptance and as an occasion for his own ministry. The invitation to the Lord's Supper is extended to all who have been baptized. Remembering that access to the table is not a right conferred upon the worthy but a privilege given to the undeserving who come in faith, repentance, and love. In preparing to receive Christ in this sacrament, the believer is to confess sin and brokenness, to seek reconciliation with God and neighbor, and to trust in Jesus Christ for cleansing and renewal. Even one who doubts or whose trust is wavering may come to the table in order to be assured of God's love and grace. Today, we remember the way Jesus showed us his love. In the last meal before his death, Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. Jesus then said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal, Jesus took the cup of wine, and after giving thanks to God, he passed it around. Jesus said to them, drink this, all of you, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, every time we eat bread like this, or every time we drink wine like this, we remember Jesus and his everlasting love. Our prayer of thanksgiving. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
it is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with choirs of angels, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. We praise you that Christ now reigns with you in glory and will come again and make all things new. Go now in God's Holy Spirit, which is not a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. Go, knowing that the perfect love of God casts out all fear today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen.